Okay, my first question is very openly phrased, very general. Why is this war happening? This war happening because uh, we have bad neighbor near us who is imperialistic and who is still uh, living by the old stuff which they had in past. Well, this war is happening because of the, I think, the everlasting um, narrative of like restoring basically the Soviet Union, I would say. Like, you know, like in, when I'm speaking Soviet Union doesn't mean that this name or this idea behind like politically is going to be introduced. It's more like this kind of imperialist notion of like having a lot of other ethnicities or nations uh, under one rule and exploiting them or like kind of making this whole like Russian world so so called like possible in many 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 regions that used to be uh, like associated or part of the USSR previously? Well I think this war didn't start a month ago uh, this war started much earlier on um, it is a conflict between some imperialistic powers. From my perspective, I consider this like, a, a, you know, changing a bit like the hierarchy and like this kind of global dominant country in the world now. So like Russia, uh, who is aggressor in this war, uh, try to, you know, somehow put themselves in the new hierarchy. My opinion is that, of course, the situation was brewing from at least 30 years. Uh, and, um, of course, it is, it is not to debate that this, is, this uh, attack of, of, of the Russian state and uh, the uh, Russian state try to just, you know, get back with the new order in the region. Geopolitics, because we have China, we have Russia, and we have their leaders, and they have their own interests, realistic interests. We can call this that way. Like now, we had a fight between uh, USA and China for like the global domination. Russia cannot uh, be part of this because it's too weak, but they want to fight for the best position in the new order. On the contrary, the Europe, Western Europe, but also. Ukraine was um, starting to get a switch uh, when there is uh, uh, talk about gen energetics and, and uh, power supply. But it's also like interest of many business groups, like we can imagine like resources and uh, oil and this gas stuff. So, so it's a war about money. They were trying to, the, to switch, for example, when it goes to gas, they tried they were uh, going to switch from Russian gas to American one. And of course, the Americans also were trying to, they were investing huge amount of money in, uh, in Ukraine. And also, if uh, you will take the uh, personal scale, that's all because of uh, power and because of this uh, biological mechanism in every human body, like when you're getting power. You're getting some kind of uh, drugs, dopes, and so on. So those people are uh, addicted from from power. But if we're going to see this from the common scale, of course, it's because of their political and geopolitical interests. So to go a little bit more specifically, there is a certain narrative uh, presented by the Russian Federation and the Putin regime about why this war is happening. It projects a number of excuses, but I would say the main, if we can focus on some of the very main ones, it's first about denazifying Ukraine. Um, it's about protecting the populations, the, the ethnically Russian and Russian-speaking populations, particularly in the area of Donbass, where they claim there has been a genocide against them going on for the past eight years. And finally, uh, that it was a necessity for them to counter uh, the ever-expanding NATO and the perceived threat 
from that expansion and its potential uh, ballistic capacities and so on. So let's, um, let's address this narrative and one by one. And tell me what is your response to the um, uh, uh, excuse of denazifying Ukraine? Yeah, well, overall, I uh, call bullshit on uh, all of those arguments. Uh, one by one about denazif uh, denazifying Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine didn't uh, need uh, denazifying, especially from uh, from the outside, in my opinion, because uh, there were. Uh, far-right groups, uh, some of them were causing uh, trouble, uh, but uh, overall uh, Nazis uh, didn't have much representation in, in political life and their influence was uh, diminishing over the last uh, few years actually. Uh, so about the denazifying uh, bullshit. Uh, well, my overall response is that all this is bullshit. Uh, but to be more specific, like, um, what means denazification? Uh, Ukrainian state, of course, deserve a lot of critics. But this is definitely not a Nazi state. This is just a, you know, propaganda statement. Uh, Nazi forces, like, or far-right uh, radicals, of course, are present in this society. Uh, but they are still uh, play quite a marginal role, actually. This is not, uh, this is visible force, this is true, uh, but this is not the force who really designed the shape of the society by any, by, by no matter they do this. Like, uh, because of this, this statement is uh, just, you know, just a label, just an excuse uh, to cover purely imperialist uh, intervention, intervention and aggression. Saying that government in Kyiv is a Nazi government is just the pure propaganda created to justify what the Russia is doing at the moment. Albo to jest operacja antyterrorystyczna, albo to jest operacja um, antyfaszystowska. There are like two ways, or attacking the fascists or attacking the terrorists. So that's the, the, like the narrative when Russia in the history was uh, invading another country. Я думаю, что это полная вообще чушь и все такое. I think it's uh, all bullshit, and uh, I can't see any like reasons to, to trust this uh, point uh, because we have Nazis in Ukraine, of course, but they're not like a total a total amount of people. Also, Nazis are everywhere, and right wingers are everywhere in Europe, in Russia, in every, every country. For sure, there were some Nazi groups, which we know about in Ukrainian, but they are also in Poland. We have right-wing organizations which are completely Nazi, and there are Nazi organizations in Greece. Uh, all over the world there are Nazi organizations. I'm not sure it's the reason to attack another country and make a genocide. And you can see Greece, which had Golden Dawn in the third position during elections. You can see Hungary, which is actually yeah, quite right wing, and they had uh, have a uh, Jobbik. We don't have uh, any far right parties in the government, in like the parliament, for two last terms, I guess. Um, and that's something that is not true about Germany, for example, <laughs> with their AFD. For the last uh, elections, it was, as I remember, 2%. And it much more less than in any European country. Yeah, so, like, uh, about what denazification we are saying? Myślę, że procent skrajnej prawicy lub the percentage of the popularity of uh, Azov uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the party, which is in, in Ukraine, it's like quite similar to the rest of Europe, which, when we are talking about neo-Nazi. But the thing is that after Maidan, they have been able to to make people uh, being active military. Uh, so they gain power from this side as well because they were inside uh, war. So that's why they got popularity on this side. What actually they did eight years ago, they helped Ukrainian Nazis to grow. First of all, because any war uh, comes also together with nationalism and also Nazism at some point. If war wouldn't start, so we could have 
absolute change of situation. Okay, yeah. So leftist ideas, progressive ideas, they started to uh, to be um, dominating here in Ukraine. And the main reason for right now why right-wingers could have some ability to grow, to rise and so because of the war. Completely on the contrary to denazification, the main force who galvanize nationalism and also anti-Russian hostility uh, in ethnic uh, means here in Ukraine is also Russian state aggression. So this is actually an attempt of nazification. Right sector as a party, as a group at the Maidan was represented by a small amount of people. But in the media of Russia and uh, all the satellites, right sector was like everywhere. In every, I don't know, house, every building, every person is a right sector. And uh, like crazy Ukrainian nationalists and all that uh, stuff. So they uh, made good advertising for them. That's why right sector during Maidan became really a big thing. And then during the war, because like they was growing, growing, because like uh, every person was thinking, okay, to which battalion do I go uh, for war? And uh, like, okay, right sector, because like you know them. And uh, Azov won, was in that uh, time like uh, much more smaller in the media represented. So like, and now we come into the same stuff. Like uh, Azov is represented in Russian media like a big, big, big uh, bubble, you know? How strong is really uh, the Azov Battalion and how did it come to the point to almost represent uh, the, the, the Ukrainian army in terms of media attention? Uh, how it uh, became uh, like uh, the sole focus of, of media, uh, it uh, probably, probably has uh, something to do with uh, uh, Russian state-owned media who, who function abroad, uh, I think, because like uh, in Ukraine itself uh, there is much less attention uh, to Azov. Talking to Ukrainian comrades, they're not the major power, they're not that big as the people think they are but the, all the cameras all the uh, news are about them because of what's going on right now in the Mariupol the Azov uh, battalion is uh, several hundreds of people but Ukrainian army is uh, many dozens of thousands of people so like to portray the whole army with this uh, infamous unit uh, is of course once again the dirty propaganda step. They're not really um, creating their own armed forces. They are part of the Ukrainian army. Ukrainian army using every group which they can use to fight against the Russian occupation. In a military structure, in like Minister of Defense or something like this, uh, Azov battalion do not uh, have like any crucial uh, ruling part, ruling role or something like this. This is definitely, this I know for sure, is that it's definitely not the unit uh, which is the, how to say, the driving force of the army or uh, some unit which really uh, giving shape to the army or something like this. In the same time, Russians got a volunteer battalion uh, like Rusic, for example, and also Wagner's uh, plenty neo-nazis. If to bring uh, deeper and to understand how the Russian government is connected with uh, uh, right wing, uh, like nationalists, Nazis, uh, all the people who was killing uh, people, who was uh, uh, making some terror, and the history brings us that they was uh, totally in connect. Hundreds of people killed during these years. These foreigners, they attack also lefties, they attack, they killed our comrades, we didn't have murderers of comrades in Ukraine. It was always in Russia. People in the government was supporting these people and uh, by their command they were killing uh, like anti-fascists, journalists, uh, different thinkers, uh, everyone. So like... You mean uh, in Russia? In Russia, yes. So like, what the fuck about what denazification we are saying if we need to denazificate uh, Russia for first of all. I mean saying that they are the only nation who helping, like, who fighting against fascism is bullshit, like, obviously. So for me, leftists who believe it, they have kind of subculture that Russians, blah, 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 from 40s, that they are this anti-fascist. When some comrades are telling me that uh, 
uh, I don't know, we have a Nazi state, Nazis are in governments and all this stuff. And when you're living in Ukraine and see the situation by your eyes, it just like goes in the, the love because it's a lie, it's a, a lot of lie. Next, uh, about uh, what about uh, genocide of uh, Donbas people? Uh, this um, I would also call bullshit uh, because uh, there wasn't a genocide going on by all accounts, except for for Russian propaganda. Like uh, uh, everybody, except uh, except Russian Russian uh, media, uh, pro-governmental media were uh, denying that uh, the genocide was happening. And uh, like, uh, of course, we uh, like. Uh, cannot uh, trust uh, fully the UN or other international institutions uh, but uh, they still have like uh, better data and uh, they still uh, more uh, trustworthy uh, on this uh, issue than, than the Russian government and they all said that there wasn't a genocide going on and actually the uh, military action in Donbass region before the war it was uh, also quite quieting down a little bit especially since uh, Zelensky took office. I don't think we can call it genocide for sure uh, maybe the people Russian people because of this growing of Ukrainian nationalism uh, they get like some discrimination but it's like something that this information you get from media. I don't have direct uh, contact with Russian people in Donbas, so we can ba base like our opinion in the media, and uh, there are not me no media that we can trust 100%. For me personally, I'm from Donbas, I'm from Donetsk, and I can say as a refugee uh, that all this uh, points about that in Donbas live in some kind of uh, special ethnic like total bullshit uh, and this some kind of mythology they created and some narrative they created to um, to have a basis for their actions I'm by myself uh, also a Russian speaker whole life uh, I was uh, born in Ukraine and my family from my uh, mother uh, side they all from Russia even in 2014, uh, I was also in uh, Lugansk and uh, in uh, near uh, uh, city Shastia named, and uh, I didn't saw that uh, there was some uh, problems with Russian speakers. The whole thing in 2014, it was made by uh, Russian army, by Russian special forces servants, and uh, by people who were already like came from Russia like FSB agents who were sitting. They were controlled by the Russians, they were supplied by the Russian soldiers, Russian arms, there were never People's Republic in Donbass. I was in the, at that war uh, with the people who natively from, like, let's say, this Russian-speaking cities from Lugansk, and they was uh, not pro-Russian, they was uh, totally pro-Ukrainian uh, people. And like they were in some uh, nationalist or Nazis or something, it was usual military people, like who become military during the war because uh, before they was just usual people, doesn't have anything uh, with the military during the life. But they felt like they have to defend their community against some invaders. Uh, yes, they have this. felt that they need to defend themselves and their community because of invaders who came to their land and they didn't ask uh, for any help at that moment, you know. They didn't want that someone uh, can come and uh, was helping them because uh, there was no problem for them. There's the usual Russian narratives about uh, try to liberate people against many different enemies, but it's always sort of false. The same was in Chechnya. It's also a bit of a story. It's some kind of historical things of Russia. So first they come into some territories, invade this, occupy this, and in some years the situation is changing. They're saying, oh, we are going to protect our people in this region, so we're going to send our army. The same uh, narrative was used when the Poland was invaded during the Second World War uh, by Stalin. 
because they came to Poland to protect Russian-speaking uh, citizens. The same narrative is used by uh, Chinese government occupying Tibet. And in every case when someone was was trying to, is trying to attack another country, there are, it's very easy uh, excuse to use. Like a Russian-speaking population genocide in Ukraine is something that Russia is doing right now, bombing Mariupol and Kharkiv and uh, small towns in Donetsk and Lugansk region, such as Popasna, Severodonetsk, Volnovakha, and also putting people in filtration camps. That's not something that we uh, um, made up, that's their name for those places. The whole rhetoric about the Donbass being the People's Republic, it's all big lies, because when Russian-controlled forces occupied Crimea, Donbass uh, and uh, Donetsk, all the territories, they created more or less like a fascist state. They brought, like you said, many tough laws like um, death penalties, uh, anti-homosexual laws, uh, very strict military rule. It have nothing to do with the People's Republic. It is ideologically much more close to the fascist state than to the People's Republic. Uh, about the expansion uh, of uh, the NATO, um, well, um, also bullshit, <laughs> because, uh, well, uh, the only argument uh, Russian uh, side has uh, about this is that uh, uh, the uh, willingness to join NATO was uh, put into Ukrainian constitution uh, several years ago uh, during Poroshenko's time. But still, uh, we need to understand that this chapter appeared in the Constitution after 2014 and after c clear aggression uh, of the Kremlin regime. Uh, on the other hand, like uh, it was mostly just a declaration and uh, NATO uh, said repeatedly that uh, they uh, are not uh, ready to take in more, uh, uh, more participants, uh, especially considering Ukraine. Uh, so this uh, argument is also bullshit. About NATO, it's like no one made uh, anything more expanding threat of NATO than Russia made in past 30 days. At the time, in the mid-2000s, uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, it was either like 50-50 uh, or even uh, like more people do not support joining, Ukraine joining NATO. Uh, then after, after 2014, uh, support uh, among the Ukrainian public to join NATO, it, it grew a bit, a, a lot, a lot actually. And uh, like to, but it still wasn't like a predominant opinion. It was still like something like sixty to forty or something like that. And uh, after this uh, full-on invasion started, of course now like uh, more than seventy percent of the people uh, by recent polls uh, support Ukraine joining NATO. So uh, popularity of NATO increases uh, with. Uh, uh, with the uh, escalation from and with uh, threats from uh, the Russian side, uh, which is it's, it's, it's pretty obvious connection. This narration that Russia was forced to bomb schools uh, because they were forced by NATO to defend themselves is, 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 is stupid, to be honest, it's just stupid. But like, come on, if uh, some country invades other country, so who is, uh, who is uh, making a mistake and who is making the aggression? Not the victim country. This idea that Russian, like that actions of Russian um, army are the consequences of this threat of Ukraine joining NATO is really victim blaming thing. The main force which push Ukraine towards NATO and to, towards Western powers is Kremlin's uh, Russian imperialist aggression. What, what other um, 
aspiration our state could have other than to join the NATO when we have such a big like uh, problematic country by our side uh, that just captures whatever territories they like uh, in the neighbor countries. If the one uh, population of geographical territory want to have independence from authoritarian state, it's going to be used by the both sides. During these days, it's hard for me to compare NATO and Russia. Of course, NATO makes some genocides like in Belgrade in, in the 90s. So we cannot say like NATO is kind of hero that we want to follow or we can trust NATO. NATO is not like a defender of the people. NATO is an armed forces of the capitalist and neoliberal states. But uh, at the same time, uh, world is, is a bit more complicated than that. And uh, if uh, somebody opposes uh, the NATO, it uh, doesn't automatically mean that uh, it's a good guy. Now we get the situation that the bombs are coming from the Russian side to the civilian people. There's always someone who makes the, like, the first step, right? Or like who's like um, actually creating atrocities at the moment, right? So we should speak about that. We will not support NATO, but in this point I would like that NATO will, you know, somehow save people's lives. And if the NATO will bomb some city in the future, then we will be against it. If you're now against Russia, then really it doesn't have to mean that you are pro-USA. Yeah, and um, as we as left, we should really try to uh, avoid that and uh, to always uh, see it otherwise, like not between the nations, but between the classes. We have to distinct it. It's not we, we, the, arm, the anarchists supporting Ukraine against Russia. No, we are supporting people of Ukraine by invi invaded by the Putin's regime. That's the most uh, important thing we have to look at. We are not support supporting Zelensky government. We're not supporting neoliberal state they want to create in Ukraine. We're supporting the people of Ukraine who are fighting against the armed invasion. There seems to be a distinct difference of perspective in regards to the question of NATO imperialism and Russian imperialism coming from leftists and anarchists that come from any country neighboring Russia, all the way from Finland to Kazakhstan. What do you think that means? Uh, it means good member from the history. Uh, like like the post-Soviet countries, of course, they have direction, direct occupation, let's say, or dependent from the Soviet Union. The Finland has a war, always wars with uh, wars with Russia or Soviet Union. So, uh, like you said, it's like the point where you're sitting is describe what you need to believe. Because I can imagine that, uh, like the if you have two narratives and you are living in somewhere in America, it's hard for you to know. You can just say it like ther theoretically, I think they have a right, but like the direct experience are super important. It's way easier to think about that being uh, in France or being in Brazil, let's say, or Argentina, because you're not neighboring with Russia. The biggest problem that you have being in Argentina or, or in Brazil or whatever, or in Chile, let's say, mostly South America, you have uh, problems with uh, American imperialism. That's a territory of big interest from Western imperialists, I think. Uh, but we are more under control and under suffering from Chinese and Russian imperialists and uh, Russian forces. Uh, that's why like, this is our reality and that's how we are... Like, that's the context we are living in and trying to, to survive and to develop ourselves. Living for a lot, like for all my life really in a basically a colony of Moscow. Like I'm not thinking of myself as like part of a, I don't know, a German colony. So it's like, uh, this is why I, my perspective comes from another enemy, you know? We as anarchists in Poland, we supported 
refugees from Belarus or from Russia. I mean, our comrades were escaping the jail sentences. Um, they were they were escaping the um, witch hunt in Russia, in Belarus, and we've seen many of our comrades in jails in Russia or in Belarus. And from the first hand, we know how that state can work. I don't know any anarchists who supported uh, pro-Russian forces or LDNR, DNR, like no one here is doing this. A lot of people left Russia because of uh, repressions toward left leftist people. And the same with Belarus. And people who escaped to Ukraine, our comrades, they are fighting for uh, Ukrainian people now. Our comrades in Russia, they've seen it from their own perspective, like every, every struggle against the Putin's regime can put you in jail or in the coffin. For sure, people will speak from their perspective, from the places where they live, right? And from the realities they live in, and from the battles or struggles they are active in. But no, the visual I mean, uh, interest. So I think that uh, there are many different imperialism. Could be like Turkey imperialism also is a problem too. It's quite the same in common things, but uh, in implementation and the uh, practice of this, it could be different. It can use different tactics. Like for example, we are fighting against Russian imperialism, and we could see uh, that tactics. And other people are fighting with another imperialists, and they could see their tactics. And it would be nice to exchange the experience how it could be in different places of the world. It's like the challenge for anarchists also, like to describe to the mm, population, right, that it's not about either or. Like there is a third way, let's say, to think of it. Like that you should not like just side with someone who is more powerful or who looks more like Western or more different from, from your oppressor. So it's just two different oppressors and they are like fighting each other now. We need to start getting organized. We need to start our discourse to be placed in this big geopolitics and so on. And we really need to start to seek for similarities and for, uh, for our um, class attitude, uh, not like, you know, cultural stuff or, I mean, it can be whatever else. And not to be just uh, taken by the nose by, by uh, this or that imperialist.